Uh, it's indeed a bizarre story. Um, first of all, I, I guess you should understand that I don't have a New Age background, uh, don't have a lexicon, wasn't that kind of a person, didn't understand it at all. Grew up as, an, as the son of a second generation army officer, making me the third, and was really spent my life just being prepared to be an army officer. And so there I was. Uh, I was an infantry officer, an airborne ranger company commander in 1987. I was in the, uh, the deserts of Jordan in a haunted valley uh, called Botnel Ghoul, training Jordanian rangers to kill Israelis, which is a whole other uh, television show on screwed up foreign policy, because the irony of it is, is that two months later we'd be in Israel teaching you know, Israelis to kill Jordanians, but uh, that's America for you, isn't it? And so there I was, uh, uh, taking out a, an objective when uh, a stray machine gun round struck me in the head. <clears throat> and I had uh, a vision, uh, for lack of a better word, I, by, from an angel. And again, I struggled with what to call this because I didn't have a lexicon to support it. Was it an apparition, a ghost, an angel, uh, a being, an entity, an, uh, an emanation? Uh, you know, what was it? Uh, but something came to me in what appeared to me as a human form, uh, although with a ra very radiant countenance around it or an aura around it, which uh, those are, again, words that I've learned since that time and said to me that I had chosen the wrong path in life, uh, that I was now to choose a path of peace, and that I was to teach peace. Well, those were pretty perplexing words for someone who at that juncture had spent 13 years of their life uh, studying the art and science of taking human life. Uh, I mean, I really know how to handle that. Uh, and when I came to and got up off the desert uh, floor, you know, I didn't jump up and say, boy, you will not believe what I just saw. And I didn't jump up and say, look, we're all going to have to do work on this issue of peace here now because we're really doing the wrong thing here. Um, I kept it to myself. I learned a long time ago to be my own counsel, uh, particularly when it had things that were issues that pertained to me. And in this case, I, I tried uh, little ways of getting around it to ask the questions of the battalion chaplain and uh, of other individuals about what they think might have happened or did they believe in the supernatural or the paranormal, did they believe in life beyond death and those kinds of things. And I got a multitude of answers and I was really just trying to bring all of those into my life, try to sort it all out. In the meantime, I had this little personal Armageddon going on inside of me. I had these confrontations with evil, I had confrontations with goodness. Uh, messages from one, messages from another, going back and forth, driving me, in my opinion, totally insane at that point. I had no control over what was happening. I was losing large blocks of time, uh, uh, which would have just been diagnosed as a dissociative disorder. Uh, and there are probably lots of viewers right now that are thinking, eh, okay, got shot in the head, a little soft tissue damage, uh, something electrochemical wrong, probably needs a little Dixie cup of psychotropic medications, uh, you know, and a towel to wipe the drool off of his face, and then we could just medically discharge him because he's explaining things, talking about hearing things and seeing things that are not there. Well, that's schizophrenia and uh, by the classic definition of things, and that's what most doctors would have done. When I came back from the deserts of Jordan, uh, my wife, uh, who was a, a critical care nurse, you know, understood what was going on with me when I explained to her and said, you need to get some help. And careerism and ego drove my, tri drove my decision process. And I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. You don't understand. And I'm in a highly prestigious assignment as a Ranger Company commander. Uh, you may, must maintain a, a very high level of performance or you're removed and someone else comes in and takes your place very quickly. So, plus, I was a career army officer. I didn't know anything else. What was I going to do? Go admit to somebody that all of a sudden I was seeing and hearing things that w weren't really there, uh, and then try to explain that away? So, careerism and ego, which is a very destructive combination, uh, drove the decisions for me at that point. That was the first time I had gone against my wife's counsel in respect to my military career. Uh, well, not probably not the first time, but certainly very critical uh, crossroads at that juncture. So I left the Ranger Battalion and went to another assignment. It was a highly classified assignment. Uh, it's funny how when we say classified, it's always highly classified. It was a classified assignment in Washington, D.C. for an organization codenamed Royal Cape. Now, I've never talked about what they are because it endangers lives if I do that, and I think they had a very viable intelligence collection mission. 
So what I did, though, to go into this organization is you were required to go through an extensive battery of psychological evaluation and testing, oral and written, and many interviews and many tests. And a psychologist, a lieutenant colonel, detailed to this organization of less than 300 people, which kind of gives you an indication of what the bizarre nature of the organization might have been. They wanted to know what your personal envelope was. And they ask you to come back and go through a, through a kind of a uh, assessment and evaluation once a quarter, like a therapy session. And it was during that therapy session, that uh, my second one at that unit, that I divulged and confided in this psychologist and said, these things are happening to me, help. I mean, I hoped he would pick up the phone and call Walter Reed Army Medical Center and take me there and do something at that point because I was out of control. My life was out of control. I had, I, I could, you know, I was waking up on the back lawn. I, I mean, I was missing blocks of time. I was waking up screaming at night. I, I mean, it was a horrifying experience for me. I mean, I had a pretty normal existence up until the gunshot wound and things were changing rapidly. So I was recruited into an organization uh, called Sunstreak. Now, this organization uh, ended up being uh, one of one of several of uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA's top secret clans of psychic spies called remote viewers. And the definition of a remote viewer uh, per the Department of Defense is an individual selected and trained to transcend time and space for the purpose of viewing persons, places, or things remote in time and space and to gather intelligence information on the same. Hmm, that's a very scary thing. Young infantry officer, four months out of the field, uh, having commanded a ranger company to find out that kind of a thing uh, from this kind of an organization. Pretty tough for me to believe. But I thought, uh, you know, long and hard about is this the job that I want? Is this where I'm going to go? I was told by my commander at that time, Tony Lackey, you do this job, you take this job, you go there, you've destroyed your career. You'll never recover from it. Uh, Debbie did not want me to go there. So again, careerism and ego said, now I've got to go there. But I struggled with it quite considerably. I mean, uh, I, I listened to Colonel Lackey and I thought, okay, well, the careerism, careerism side of this says don't go do it because it's out of the mainstream. It's doing something quite bizarre. The ego aspect of it said, well, these people are telling me that they can teach me to transcend time and space. That's a very ego-driven issue, I mean, to go pursue that. Um, when I sat and talked to the psychologist and said, what do you recommend? I mean, what, what's your take on all of this? It was essentially this. Well, look, you're describing things to us that, are, that don't exist, so that's paranoid schizophrenia. I mean, we can give you the medications, we can medically discharge you, or you can go to this unit where you can take this new ability that, that's presented itself to you, and maybe, just maybe, they can teach you how to harness it and use it, and you can continue to serve well and faithfully. That was my choice. My choice was to go to the unit, and I don't think anybody would dispute that. I struggled for a long time while in the unit. I went through a very difficult, long, arduous training process to become a coordinate remote viewer. Uh, the training process at that time took what they estimated would be 12 to 18 months, uh, which is interesting because now we're teaching it and it takes us three days to get to where, we're, where it took me six to eight months to be. Uh, it's a very structured, disciplined, regimented process of learning to do this. You started off just by looking at the historical documents pertaining to the Soviets and the Czechs and the Chinese and the Israelis and the Germans and the British involvement in all of this, how they were taking uh, slices of the paranormal and trying to figure out a way that they could use it to gather intelligence for their nations. Uh, you read from, you know, on a four drawer file say from the front of the first drawer all the way to the back of the bottom drawer. And it, took, it took a long time to do that. Then you began lecture, which was months long. And uh, in the lecture, you were required to write an essay every week at the conclusion of your, of your lecture, which was graded by the other members of the unit. And if you failed the lecture, if you failed the essay, you failed the lecture, you repeated the lecture the next day. Ugh, that was terrible. Uh, to go back through it again and again, especially for someone like me who didn't do very well at writing and, and was not very good at articulating what it was that they experienced or gleaned from the exercise. Then you started stage one training, <clears throat> which was this, uh, this ability to learn to take uh, a series of encrypted coordinates. The coordinates not being Cartesian or Grid Mercator or Lat Long. 
Uh, these coordinates were randomly assigned numbers which became representative of the concept of the target in the matrix of the collective unconscious. And you don't want to think too hard about that. You just want to kind of accept it uh, and understand that it works. If you, uh, if you uh, try to figure it out, it's kind of like trying to figure out how electricity moves down a wire. Nobody's done that yet. And so uh, just accept it that it works, just like we accept it when we flip the light switch, the light comes on. You then went into uh, learning to decode this ideogram, which was an autonomic response to these coordinates. And after decoding the ideogram, then you were taught how to do stage twos. Now we're many months into the training process of learning to do this. Training target after training target after training target. Uh, stage twos deals with uh, the ability to perceive non-physical non -physical data at remote in the target site uh, that's temperature related, texture related, color, sounds, tastes, smells, uh, dimensionals, verticals, horizontals, diagonals, mass and density, even energetics. Moving from there into basic sketching techniques, learning how to capture geometric patterns and learning how to capture images that you perceive at the site. Not unlike um, the iris of a camera snapping open and closing, and opening and closing in different parts of the site and being able to capture in your mind's eye these textures and images and, and patterns and being able to regurgitate them onto the page. See, it's, uh, it's a strange process. It's a process now of keeping one foot in the conscious matrix and one foot in the unconscious matrix of the mind. And then moving into stage fours, which deals with an extension of stage twos bifurcating stage twos uh, or dimensionals out of stage twos as a separate category now, dealing with aesthetic impact as it relates to the site, emotional impact as it relates to the site and the viewer, the tangibles and intangible concepts like governmental and religious and military and uh, you know political, those kinds of things. Uh, and then dealing with analytical overlay, which is the process of your own conscious mind's uh, imagination and learning how it matches uh, bits and pieces of data relevant to the target site in analytical overlay signal. And all of these things being in stage four now that you're learning to deal with and work with. Moving into stage fives where you take uh, some uh, intangible concept or AOL signal and stage five it, uh, producing emanations, disengaging from the signal line as we say, producing emana emanations dealing with objects and attributes and topics and, or subjects and topics. Uh, and then moving into stage six, where you replicate the stage four matrix, now a stage six matrix, uh, and produce sketches that are very elaborate, that are overlays with analytical overlay, uh, assembling data pieces into a very elaborate sketch called a rendering now. You can even do modeling. So that was the training process that I went through. And in going through that training process, I struggled for the vast majority of a year, at least the better part of a year I struggled with it, saying, you know, always able to rationalize away what I was doing and how I was doing it and the results I was getting. And I did well at it, not because of my own prowess, but because I was just good at doing the structure that they taught me to do. I was good at fragmenting myself and allowing them to rebuild me. That was a kind of a pro byproduct of having been trained as a soldier, raised as a soldier, and existing as a soldier. When you jump out of an airplane at, uh, in the dark of night over some drop zone that you've never been in before with 686 other men in the air with uh, 130 pounds of uh, weapons and ammunition strapped to you and five pounds or five gallons of food gas and a claymore strapped to the outside and the blasting caps in your pocket. When you do that, when you learn to follow the rules and do those kinds of things, Learning how to be a remote viewer is the same thing. It is easy to drop your personality and let it drop below the surface, fragment yourself, and allow them to build you back up through the structure. The simple targets in early on stage one and two, I was easily able to rationalize away my ability to, gap, to capture those targets accurately. Um, as the, comp, the gestalts, or the nature of the target, the, the target itself, and the surrounding area of the target became more complex, I became more convinced of the validity of this particular phenomenon. I became more convinced that it did work and that it was of use then. Uh, if it was something that did work and you could pull out 30% accurate information or 50 or 60 or 70% accurate information, then it was something that could be used to benefit some, uh, all of humankind, find a cure for AIDS or cancer or be used in uh, medical diagnostic uh, work to 
look at issues that, uh, you know, degenerative diseases that are reaching epidemic proportions in, in men and women. How do we find the answers to those? You could also use it in societal and environmental issues. You could use it in industrial uh, issues. You could use it in science. You could use it in a multitude of areas, including law enforcement, because it provides pieces of the puzzle that you cannot glean by any other means. It shortens a research timeline from maybe 10 years to nine years and six months. If that's the case, how many lives are saved in six months? So I reached a philosophical impasse with my profession at that point. I realized that this works. It is a tremendous gift. And if that's the case, then I have a moral and an ethical responsibility to tell the story. Well, being a remote viewer in the military community uh, certainly had its advantages, advantages and disadvantages. The advantage was you were in an optimum learning environment and an optimum environment for the application of this. The disadvantage was you were every day, day in, day out, five days a week, looking at a rogues gallery of targets. They were not interested in sending you to pleasant places uh, that would allow you to enlighten yourself or develop a, a better understanding of humanity or the nature of humanity. If that was gleaned, it was gleaned passively on your own or on extra work that we did as a group of remote viewers. So because of the kinds of targets that we looked at, there was, despite the claims of any of my former colleagues that there was never a toll taken, there is certainly a cumulative toll taken on the individual, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, having to look at death, destruction, or even the mundane tasks of looking and trying to figure out on some missile blossom somewhere, silo blossom, where a warhead, a nuclear warhead might be, uh, let alone uh, trying to tap into the mind of a Soviet test pilot somewhere to, to see what he, whether you could glean the subtle nuances of what it was like for him to fly a new MiG aircraft. Uh, I mean, it was uh, a desperate, dangerous, mundane, yet you know, volatile kind of work. What did you do when you go home at night? You know? When you stand on the decks of Pan Am 103 and watch it explode, six and seven and eight, 10, 12 times and describe those events. What do you do when you go home at night? What does Debbie say to you? How was your day at the office, honey? You know, it, you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible existence in that respect. And because you do those things, what happens is you begin to lose the ability to communicate with the rest of humanity. Because when you go home, your friends don't want to hear about this travel into a four-dimensional world that you just made. You know, you come back, you have an inability to describe it anyway because a four-dimensional world defies our language, our ability to express it. It would be like coming from a two-dimensional world into this world, the three-dimensional world, and then going back to that one and trying to explain what we see and take for granted here. You know, there's no language for it. So that inability to communicate to express what you see and what you feel on a day-to-day -day basis begins to disintegrate you. It begins to, to, it begins to etch into your soul. It begins to degrade a lot of things about your personality. Uh, you become what some might describe a sociopath, what others might call uh, a recluse. Uh, what happens is the circle of friends that you have begins to narrow and narrow and narrow until about the only people you really deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in any form of conversation are the remote viewers because they understand, you see. The wife and the children and the other friends at church or at work or other, other places, they don't understand. Only the people that have been where you have been understand. And for me, that started taking a tremendous toll. As for the angel that I saw in the first vision who came back time and again, my theory on this is that once I was on the path I was supposed to be on, then the angel had done his job. And so while I still experienced uh, what I considered benevolence and malevolence in my life, I still had nightmarish episodes. They diminished considerably, and they became more poignant. They became more pointed, more specific, more focused in what was trying to happen to me. It was not just this, uh, this hodgepodge, this melee or montage of data and information that was swirling around in my head. These were focused efforts to either get me on the path and keep me there or to pull me from the path. There were issues that were that presented to me that were enlightening to me in that they brought me into a better awareness of the nature of humanity, why we're here, what our focus should be while we're here, where we're going when we leave here. Uh, 
they brought into, in, into focus for me the existence of other worlds, other places, other things, other civilizations, benevolent and malevolent. It was a, it was a tremendously, uh, it was a tremendously, I, want, I don't want to use the word enlightening again because at that point it was still perplexing, but it was bringing into my life knowledge that later in my life began to transform itself into wisdom. And there's a significant difference between the two. Uh, the remote viewing experiences in this particular unit were, as I said, you know, they were, they, we were limiting ourselves to, uh, to operational targets and training targets. And people often ask the question, well, didn't you go look at the JFK assassination or the Martin Luther King assassination or uh, are there aliens amongst us uh, or are there other worlds and other places? Uh, why didn't you look at those kinds of things? And, you know, the answer is that we did our jobs day in and day out. We did what the U.S. government asked us to do day in and day out. And the U.S. government never asked us to look at things that they had the answers to. They already knew the answers to those things. They didn't need remote viewers to go put our piece into the pie again, you know, see? So that should answer for you what the answers to, that should give you an indication of what the answers to who killed JFK and, you know, who killed Martin Luther King and, and are there aliens amongst us and those kinds of things. They're, they're, the answers are simple without me even saying them. And, you know, <clears throat> I have to say that I, I know a lot of other, you know, either former colleagues or individuals that have been trained by former colleagues that will say, oh, well, yes, I remote viewed Jesus Christ or I did this or I did that. Uh, or Satan, or what have you. In all of the thousands of remote viewing sessions that I've done, I've never seen God. I've existed in the realm of the Creator. I've, I've stepped into the realm of the Creator. That I know. And I can feel a presence, and I know and understand that there is a Creator. But I've never been privy to that. You know, I didn't queue up and get to go, you know, take a number and stand there and see him, it, her, whatever it is. I didn't get to. I've never seen Christ. I've never seen Satan or Lucifer. I've never seen Mohammed. I've never seen Buddha. Never seen any of them. But I can tell you this, and every other remote viewer that's being honest with you will tell you this, every other military remote viewer will say that we have all stood in the presence of other worlds and other beings and other civilizations, uh, benevolent and malevolent. I mean, we've seen them. We've been there. We've tasted them. We've smelled them. We've, you know, we've looked at them. But we didn't go there specifically with the purpose of going there. We just happened upon them. You know, it wasn't as though the U.S. government gave us an address. Remember how the coordinate system works. It must be assigned numbers randomly to the concept of the target in the matrix. Now, we did often open searches, but those were just, you know, exercises moving us out to wherever the signal line would take us for whatever specific purpose. But there was no feedback. There was no data used and brought back into DIA or into CIA. They were experiential in nature. We went to these worlds and experienced them and found out many things. For instance, the fact that just showing up there, developing the ability to go there, does not make you privy to the wisdom contained there. There's a reason for being here. The reason for being here in this existence is to Make yourself worthy to gain as much knowledge as you can, to understand as much about the nature of humanity as you can, our purpose, our significance and insignificance to the matrix of all creation. Many, many other things to include knowing somewhere in the timeline of our soul what it is that tethers us to this physical dimension and being able to resolve that. So every time we did happen upon these other beings in these other places, it is arrogant to step back and say, oh yes, and they spoke with me and told me this and told me that, and I came back with this piece of information and that piece of information. If you did, then I would expect that the quality of life in this planet would be considerably better than it is at this juncture. I would, I would, cons I would say that you know, if you had the ability to do that and come back with all these kinds of answers that, that uh, Greed and coveting and war and other things would be virtually non-existent because you would come back with these great enlightened messages and all the keys and codes to the kingdom and be able to change the nature of humanity, right? But that doesn't happen yet. It's because there are not enough people ready to go do this. And it's a process of learning, of gaining knowledge about yourself, of going to that place in your soul and finding out what it is that you have to resolve now in order to prepare yourself. And I hate to use the term because it sounds too theological, but make yourself worthy 
to go receive this information. When we happened upon these places, we were acknowledged as passive intruders. I mean, you were looked at. You could see. And it, it, the thing the listeners must, or the viewers must understand here is that there is a, it's, it's not a language. It's an unspoken language out there. You know, out there in the four-dimensional world of the creator, it's not that people speak English or they speak something else. It is a dial. It is a language and understanding of the soul. It's all unspoken, unwritten. It is all communicated in a completely different way in which we might even be able to fathom and you know, grasp it in, in, in this dimension. But you, the words come, the understanding comes through the eyes, through the image of what you see. And we form the images because it is perceptory in nature. We sense the presence of an entity or an, ener an energy, an essence, a soul, an energy that's there. And we form it into something that we're comfortable with looking at. You know, much of, I mean, I don't expect that everything out there certainly looks like us, and, but it probably doesn't look, all look like reptiles with wings either. Uh, or grays, or other kinds of things. Those be kind of become a common acceptance of a formation or perception, an analytical overlay, if you will, that says, I see or perceive this thing in this way. And then it becomes kind of uh, the process of suggestion. If I see it that way, and they see it that way, that person sees it in that way, and then it just kind of follows suit. That doesn't mean they don't exist. That doesn't mean that that's not how they look. It's just an explanation as to how it could be happening for us. So that's what we experience there in the ether. One of the, uh, one of the remote viewing uh, sessions that was done that was recounted in the book dealt with the, the Ark of the Covenant. And a lot of people want to know about that all the time. What is it? Why? It was a very bizarre session. And the thing that the, the viewers have to understand is that there's no feedback to it. Feedback meaning there's nothing to really accurately cl close the loop on it. So. Let's just talk about the model of how we evaluate so that we can know whether or not what I'm getting ready to tell you has any validity or credibility whatsoever. Uh, in the model structure in coordinate remote viewing, re remote viewers are, are, are used on what are called calibration targets or training targets. Those are targets that have known quantifiable attributes that, uh, that relate to that, that target itself. And when a viewer does a session, there are all sorts of bits and pieces of colors and textures and the other things we talked about in stage two and stage fours and sketches that are all aspects of the target site. But there are 10 principal elements that you're going to be evaluated against. And that allows you then, or your evaluator then, to look at your results and say, you captured this aspect of it. You captured this and this and this, and give you a, a a numerical rating, a percentage rating of your 50% accurate, 40, 30, 10, uh, 80, whatever it might be. Never saw anybody get 100. Never, despite many claims of former colleagues. Never saw 100% at all. Uh, and I've looked through every session in the historical files of that organization. Uh, unless it was to guess something as simple as uh, what color is the ball, you know, red or blue. Yeah, now we got it. But to look at something that was a very complex gestalt, no. Because we all look at it from a different perspective, different interpretations, different analytical overlays. So when a viewer is tracking at somewhere like 50, 60, 70 percent when they're climbing, then it's safe to pull the viewer and work the viewer on a target that has no feedback, if you understand. Because what's happening now is if you're running around 70 percent accurate or 60 percent accurate, then statistically speaking, Scientifically speaking, logically speaking, mathematically speaking, you're going to produce data that's going to be plus or minus some percentage points around that neighborhood of 60% or 70% accurate. It's at that, that time that they would send us against something, or we would send each other against a target that had no feedback, like the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the way I perceived the Ark of the Covenant was to see this very powerful object. Uh, and, and again, without a great deal of theological background, I mean, one can pick up any of the scriptures and look or much of the analysis provided and see that, uh, as we understand it through the interpretation of man, that the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, was designed very specifically, made of a, a very specific material, shittim wood, and then it covered in gold, and met, had to meet certain dimensional and, uh, and height aspects and quality aspects. And as we perceived this, I say we now, meaning that there were other remote viewers that looked at the Ark of the Covenant as well. 
Uh, and I guess I, I want to talk first and just say, what was it? Well, it was, a, it was a device that was carried. It was portable, which was the reason that it was designed the way it was, to be carried through the wilderness with Moses and the people, uh, to be carried and brought to the temple each time they set the temple up, which was simply poles and, 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 and linen walls, and then to set up the temple. And in the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, is where they would bring the ark. The ark spun a hole to another dimensional opening. That's what the ark was used for. It was used to open a door into the four-dimensional world of God, to where the Creator existed. That was when the high priests entered the inner sanctum in the Holy of Holies to go receive revelation for the people. That was the purpose of it. And so it was put away so that there is no door because we are here for a reason. We are here to exercise free agency, to be able to choose right or wrong. We are here to learn about ourselves, to learn the nature of ourselves, the purpose for being here, where we will go when we leave here. We are here to gain an education. That's what we're here for. We're here to gain wisdom, knowledge, and then wisdom. That's what we're here for. If the portal were here and, and, and existed for us now, and we could spin it up and step there, then what free agency would there be? You see, that was all part of the great grand plan, was that you know, the knowledge wouldn't be easy. It would be difficult. It would be a struggle to gain. When I saw the ark, I saw and stood in the presence of it. And around it was, I mean, there was so much energy emitting from it that all around it was this ball of light but immediately layering itself around this ball of light or energy, for lack of a better term, was this layer of evil, of just absolute slime. I mean, looking inside at the ark as though it were pasted to the glass of a fishbowl, looking inside at it, and this fishbowl hold this power, holding it back, in a, holding it in abeyance, holding it back so that it could not come in to touch it or be near it. Yet it was just this sense in presence of being there, of just this coveting of wanting to have that key, that doorway in their presence, and yet we're not allowed to have it. There's another significant part that I seven, several sev, seldom talk about, and that was that for the first time in my life, I understood, I think, uh, and this somewhat defies language, I understood the nature of goodness and evil, because I stood in the presence of goodness and power and light that was so powerful that I understood it as evil, because the power to create is the power to destroy. And all of that exists in, one, in that one realm. I mean, that the power of the creator is also a destructive power. And so I stood in, in, the, in, in the presence of pure goodness and light and understood that it was so significant that it registered to me as evil. And that was a very perplexing uh, approach to an understanding of the, of the nature of, of, of the creator and of creation and of destruction. Well, as we talked about earlier in the program, we talked about uh, me finally coming to this conclusion that this, this phenomena really did work. And if that was the case, then I was at this philosophical impasse with my profession. And I felt that I had a moral and an ethical responsibility to tell the story about remote viewing, about this great gift that remote viewing was. Because it was something that didn't deserve to be sequestered away in the bowels of the Defense Intelligence Agency to be used as a collection asset. Or ultimately, if they took it to the next evolutionary step, which was to do remote influencing, that now we were going to turn it into a weapon. It was no longer a passive collection asset. It was going to be an active. Uh, aggressive weapon of war to be able to reach out and alter the mind of another human being. And that was the intent of it. So I'm not alone in my quest at that juncture uh, to turn around and expose the nature of this particular, of this great gift. Uh, there were others that did it. I just happened to be the one that moved on it first because I, that's where it took me. Others retired and, and did other things with it. And I brought it out to try to talk about it because I wanted the credibility of the military lashed into it. The remote viewing has been around for millennia. It's a gift that we have had and has been inherent to each of us, yet just undiscovered in many of us, for all our lives. It's not unique to me or any other remote viewer. Anyone can learn to use it and develop it. And that's the great 
ma magic of the thing. And all that happened with it is that it was lost, it was put away, and now we were hiding it. And the morphic resonance was not taking place because it was being hidden. It was, you know, squashed down to 18 people here in this particular unit. There were other units that, that used it as well, maybe five or 10 or another 15 over here, et cetera, et cetera. But it was not being allowed to blossom out to its full potential. So it, the, the ability to do it was being hidden away. Well, I wanted to bring it forward. I did. Others did as well. It's out there now. And now what's happening is this morphic resonance, this hundredth monkey effect is blossoming up. And people are learning at 10 times the speed that any of us ever learned. Uh, and they're far more accurate as remote viewers than any of us ever were in the military remote viewing program. I mean, the students we train now, uh, I mean, it's shameful. <laughs> they're so much better than any of us ever were. The, the only thing that we, the reason we're up teaching it me and other former colleagues is because we had the experience of being in a pure environment and learning it. But other remote viewers are all better than we, any of us ever were. They just don't have you know, the background that we had. So, but they'll get it. They will get there. But for telling the story, there were some very severe repercussions. Had I been retired and told the story, the repercussions may, would certainly not have been as severe. Because if I were retired and I started telling the story and applying the military application or label to it, it would have required the intelligence community uh, to come back to the Congress of the United States and to say, we want to bring this individual back on active duty for the purposes of court-martialing them. Of course, court-martial them for what? Uh, for dereliction of duty, wrongful disclosure of classified information. What kind of classified information? Uh, a top secret clan of psychic spies, a psychic warfare program. Oh, really? You see, so that's what precluded that from taking place, because the intel community has a special access program. They're not going to bring an active uh, or a retired officer off retirement status and have to tell the Congress of the United States why, for the purposes of court-martialing them, in order to protect the program that, that they're trying to bring in, this individual in and stop them from talking about, because it it's a defeat, defeats its purpose. If they had another option, the option would have been to take the individual that was retired, retired and to turn around and pass the case over to uh, the FBI. And it would have been required the same kind of an explanation. Like, why, are you, why do you want us to investigate and or uh, prosecute the individual for espionage? You know, The reason you would have to do it is you have to explain to the FBI again. They didn't want to do that either. So the best thing to do is to grab the active duty guy that's talking about this program and make an example out of it destroy his life, discredit him, threaten the lives of his family and family members, threaten his life, end his career miserably, make it so that he has lost 18 years of his life, destroy everything that he believed in and held sacred, everything. 18 years, no pension, not even unemployment, nothing, over, despite the fact that he loses his name and, his, and everything that he has in his family because of it, because, you know, the wife... Now, remember back to early in the program, we talked about those decisions based on careerism and ego. Well, the wife, Debbie, could see this coming and knew this was going to happen. And it was, you know, just these salacious little things of putting, like, letters in the mail and sending them to Debbie that were false letters or tapes of conversations with no re of snippets of com phone conversations that would then be addressed to one of my children on a cassette tape with no return address so that they could listen to their father uh, who was separated from their mother at that time, talked to a girlfriend on the phone. Because they, what they wanted to do is destroy the very fabric that held this individual together. Whatever it was that gave me strength enough to talk about it, they wanted to unravel it. And that was to attack my family, and to attack my career, to attack my name. That's how they destroy a human being. And then they think you'll stop telling the story. But anybody that ever experiences that, has to persevere, and you persevere by just saying, I can't stop. If you stop, they win. And that's what they want you to do. They want you to break down, put a gun in your mouth, or stop and be afraid. And if you're afraid, then they win, and truth will never be known. And so that's how I fought it. I just kept falling forward, even if in, in many cases it was simply falling forward, just leaning and letting one foot drop in front of the other, the momentum of my life just kept me going. Not because I'm braver than anybody else, because I'm not. 
It wasn't because I didn't feel sad about losing my career, because I certainly did. It devastated me. It devastated me to lose my family, you know? If I could turn back time to that day in 1987 in the desert of Jordan, I have three choices. I could raise up a little bit more, and it would all be over. Two more inches, and I would have been gone. Or I could duck, and I would have retired this year as a lieutenant colonel, or stayed because my efficiency report said destined to wear stars and gone after that elusive general officer star. Or I could be where I am now, teaching remote viewing. There are days when I would choose one of the three. All, every day is different. Every day is different. Uh, it's never easy. And every day you look back over the mythology, your own personal mythology, and try to decide what would I choose today. I love it. So that kind of brings us to you know, the conclusion of where am I at this point in my life, and what's the direction I'm going in. One beautiful thing that remote viewing has done for me is it's helped me to understand the nature of myself to a certain extent. I still don't have a grasp of it. It's like trying to hold jello for me. Uh, we are all very complex, multidimensional human beings. We are all very old souls with many aspects to ourselves. Uh, understanding us is kind of a matter of perspective and proportion. It's a difficult thing to, to really grasp. But I understand the nature of humanity, and I understand our purpose for being here, I believe. And I understand where we're going. And it's not some gloom and doom thing being brought about by aliens or you know, our own disasters. It's, it's, it is understanding the cycles of human societal evolution. And there have been a number of authors that have written about it. Probably Strauss and his uh, uh, colleagues are, are probably the most notable. And, and we talk about uh, in Seculora and Seculorum, and we talk about time and again, the cycle, the return of the eternal return. Uh, and we talk about this, irrespective of our cultural differences, we evolve as a society on this globe, uh, a human society. Our environment evolves with us. All things evolve with us on this globe in which we exist. And it goes in cycles. The ancient calendars all roll in cycles. None of them are Newtonian and linear. That's just how we apply it because it works for us. Uh, in our conscious minds, and our conscious everyday existence. But cycles we move in. And these cycles, as we understand them his, through the historical analysis, are somewhat 85 to 110 years long, with secula inside these cycles moving at about 20 to 35 years. And many things impact and change those times. We are, the phases, those four secula in the seculum, are a build-up phase, a sustainment phase, an unraveling phase, and a destructive phase. We are right now in probably the latter third of an unraveling phase. In our lifetime, we will probably not see the true force of the destructive phase. But what the destructive phase has meant to humanity in the last 1,800 years of measured time has always been some catastrophic, cataclysmic event, which has always been global warfare or warfare on an ever-increasing scale of lethality and precision. And that's what we have to look forward to if we project forward in time with the historical models, is to say that that is our destiny. Now the object is, or the question is, do we accept the destiny or do we change the outcome of the destiny? And if we know that we can change the very nature of matter in laboratory experiments through the power of the human mind simply by looking at matter, we change the nature of it. If we know, and we do, that we can change quantum particles in their orbit simply by looking at them and thinking of them, that is a power expressed through the human mind in a very subtle way that, that is impacting upon the fundamental building blocks of all matter in our universe. And if you understand that matter has a spirit, because spirit begets matter, it's not the other way around. If you understand those concepts, remote viewers do, because they exist in that four-dimensional world and come back with that understanding of those things, then we understand that when, as a remote viewer, you learn to transcend time and space, that you are omnipotent, omniscient, all-seeing, all-knowing, can be omnipresent. When you see that happen, you see that sparkle in the viewer's eyes the very first time they do it and realize that I just went 4,000 miles away in 30 seconds. When you see that magic happen, then they begin to understand that they are gods, that they are co-creators. If you understand that you are that, then you can understand that you have the ability to change the outcome of human history or the human destiny. We do not have to accept 
What history tells us is our fate, as our destiny. We can change the outcome of that, and remote viewing will help. Just for the viewer's information, we do have a company called Remote Viewing Technologies, which does teach uh, coordinate remote viewing and extended remote viewing. And uh, if you're interested in that and finding out about our classes, our seminars, and workshops, there will be a series of numbers listed for you on this tape. And you can contact me uh, and or company representatives through those numbers. Well, uh, about two months after TWA Flight 800 uh, went down, I was contacted by Christina Borges and a producer, two-time Emmy Award-winning producer for CBS Reports uh, in Manhattan, New York. And she asked if I would use uh, remote viewing technologies, uh, the company, uh, to employ uh, police officers to augment their investigative uh, efforts in search of uh, the answers to what brought Flight 800 down. And so we have been training in remote viewing technologies about, we've been training police officers for about two years at that juncture. We had about 300 and some odd police officers trained. So we employed 60 police officers who were working pro bono uh, across the country, and we scattered them purposely because we didn't want to be anybody to be able to identify specifically where they were or get to all 60 of them. And we used their, their remote viewing skills after we calibrated them. We used them against uh, TWA Flight 800, going backwards in time to perceive an event. And that's all they knew. <clears throat> and we were trying to see what kinds of pieces of evidence they could pull out of uh, the flight, what happened to the flight, uh, where was the flight struck, uh, what, ha you know, what, what were the images, what were the perceptions of that, the events that took place that night. And the remote viewers all perceived elements of a missile and a missile and ships and water and aircraft and helicopters and other things. But probably the most critical thing that they pulled from all of this was about 80% of them saw something that they described as a rod of light, or others called it a beam of light that came from the ground, not the water. And in all of the profiles that they sketched of the aircraft, all of the impact points for this beam of light or rod of light were on the left-hand side of the aircraft, which did not support the missile theory. The missile theory was that the, the missile came from the water or from out in the water from either a submarine or from a ship or something else, and that all of the points of impact would have been on the right-hand side. And so it caused us to look very carefully at where and what and uh, might, what might have happened, what, where would this rod of light come from or this beam of light. And then we started looking at the lay of the land and identified Brookhaven National Labs and a top secret naval weapons test facility that shared a fence line with, uh, with the National Laboratory. We started uh, asking individuals that worked at the labs what was going on there, what was being tested. And gradually we came to individual sources that indicated to us that uh, the weapon that was being tested the night uh, the Flight 800 was struck, was a high-powered microwave weapon, a directed energy weapon being built in support of the Strategic Defense Initiative. And it was a weapon that produced 1.4 gigawatts of power, that's a billion watts of power, in a concentrated stream of electrons guided by a self-generated electromagnetic field. And that weapon has an electromagnetic pulse effect. That's what it kills with. And it's designed to kill systems. Uh, and that night, a drone Tomahawk missile was fired from the decks of the USS Normandy that was, was climbing up to altitude to be fired at by this high-powered microwave weapon when TWA Flight 800 came in in a flight corridor that was established by the FAA because this test was, was going on. This cor corridor was codenamed Betty. And TWA Flight 800 came into what is called the gun target line. They came in between Brookhaven National Labs, where the weapons system was located, and the drone Tomahawk missile, which was going to be fired on by the HPM weapon. The drone would have gone down into the water, and then they would have just, you know, there was an aircraft that was tracking the drone that would have then uh, sent Navy SEALs in helicopters to go into the water to recover the, web, the, the, the drone Tomahawk so that they could dissect it and see how. Uh, they might harden it against electromagnetic pulse effect or EMP effect. And of course the weapons builders would have looked at how was their weapon, uh, what was the effect of their weapon on the drone Tomahawk. 
how can they tweak the weapon or improve the weapon so that it kills with more effectiveness. So it was a, it was a joint effort in the weapons test. And unfortunately, Flight 800 came in low, slow, and late in Corridor Betty, came into the gun target line, and we were uncertain as to exactly what the mechanism for uh, triggering the weapon was. We, we, we had a number of sources that kind of just offset one another. One was that it was an automatic acquire and fire uh, mechanism, which said that radar sweep would have been looking for the drone tomahawk when they were, had notification that the tomahawk came up, it was looking for a radar indication that the, that the target was in position. When it looked and tracked the, the drone, TWA Flight 800 came in between the drone and the radar, so it saw them as one and the same, and when it acquired the target and had it over the target area, it fired on it instantly at the speed of light. And the other was that there was a mistake that a technician misread the radar scope indications and thought that he had acquired the drone Tomahawk when in fact he had acquired 800 uh, commercial airliner and then pushed the button to fire the weapon thinking he was killing the drone Tomahawk and instead hitting flight 800. <clears throat> um, after all of this was brought to bear, uh, there was a, a large report that was prepared, uh, it was presented to CBS. Uh, the CBS executives refused to do the report. Uh, the producer uh, was subsequently fired. Uh, the offices were raided by the FBI on all of the investigative data that we pulled in after about four months of work uh, and four months of remote, remote viewing work uh, that just continued to augment the investigative effort from this small team uh, for CBS reports. Uh, so the whole project was scrapped by CBS because CBS is owned by GE. GE owns, has a subsidiary which is Philips Labs, which has now been sold off to a foreign, uh, as a foreign corporation. But Philips was the weapons designer. Uh, the Philips Labs built the high-powered microwave weapon that was being built in support of the SDI initiative. And the reason the whole thing was covered up was because uh, on May uh, 17th, 1993, Les Aspen, the Secretary of Defense for the Clinton administration, the brand new Clinton administration, uh, declared to the American people that we were at the quote, end of the Star Wars era, end quote, meaning that we were now no longer going to continue to build weapons uh, that would be put on platforms and placed in orbit around, uh, around our planet to kill satellites or to kill uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles at the, boat, at the boost phase or post-boost phase. So that, that was pretty alleviating to a lot of people. Nobody wanted that to happen. And whether you're an advocate of or a proponent of uh, the SDI initiative or not is immaterial. What's a, what has to be understood at this point is that Les Aspen said we weren't doing it anymore, and the presidential, uh, President uh, Clinton, his administration said we are not doing this anymore. But in fact, they continued to spend billions of dollars uh, to develop these weapon systems, and the weapon brought down a commercial airliner four months before the re-election bid by President Clinton. So the cover-up, the lie had to be brought into, brought into place because he could have, if we had shot it down with a missile, it would have been a legitimate accident, an honest mistake, and we would have admitted it to the people and paid off the surviving family members, and, and life would have gone on. But we had, to, we had to create a lie and a deception because we were trying to get a president reelected whose administration had told the American people they weren't building this weapon anymore. Okay. Well, we know it's a microwave. We knew that it was a microwave weapon for a number of reasons. One, we had uh, statements. Uh, which of course were non-attributable, and they were from individuals that uh, wanted to remain anonymous to protect their, uh, protect their jobs, protect perhaps their lives, uh, certainly to protect uh, their livelihoods and everything else that they held sacred in life, because to admit it, admit something like this would have been the end of everything that they knew and held sacred. Uh, but they indicated and told us uh, in no uncertain terms that the weapon system was being tested. Uh, and we also went uh, to various sources on the internet before this all exploded uh, and looked at the Phillips Labs projection schedule for, and test projection schedule, which included uh, ground-based testing during the time that TWA Flight 800 was, was brought down. Their projections for space testing uh, went into 1998, 99, uh, the year 2000, 2006, between 2000 and 2006, their projection schedule said that they would now have a weapons platform in space. Uh, we also go ahead. We also knew uh, 
uh, based on Suffolk County Medical Examiner reports uh, that came back, uh, and, and which we got our hands on, and other Suffolk County Medical Examiner personnel uh, gave us statements that said that individuals uh, were brought from the water, uh, flight attendants were brought from the water, that were located in the galley where this high-powered microwave would have struck uh, center of mass because it acquired it with a radar-based uh, uh, target acquisition system. Uh, that they had pieces of the galley, metal from the galley, fused to their backs, fused to their backs. That doesn't happen in an explosion. The, the heat is not intense enough uh, to fuse metal to tissue in that respect. That only happens when you have 1.4 billion watts of power striking something like that. Uh, we had other indications from medical examiner personnel that uh, cranial cavities were being opened and that brains were being taken out and eyes were being taken out because uh, eyes and brains and uh, spinal fluid and blood all gel instantly when hit by a high-powered microwave. And since this was, of course, an accident, but now we had human bodies that have been microwaved, uh, the Defense Department and the Department of Energy were not going to pass up the opportunity to, uh, to do autopsies and, and or to look at, the, at the, neural, uh, the neural destruction that takes place in the human body when hit by a microwave. So what they were doing is, is, is removing the brains and the eyes and other things that they wanted to take, organs that they wanted to examine, putting the bodies in, powdering with formaldehyde, and then sealing the castets, caskets and marking them uh, that they were you know, impartial remains and that the casket was not to be opened. And so they were shipped home to, to surviving relatives and the caskets were never opened. And there was a process of exhumation being done in France for us uh, before this report was canceled by CBS, where we were actually going to exhume bodies and try to take a look at it and find out whether or not indeed some of these cavities, the brains have been removed and the eyes have been removed as well. Well, hello. My name is Peggy Kane. Thanks for joining us. This is Off the Record, and we are coming to you live from Tucson, Arizona. It's March 19th. Uh, tonight, Ted is not here. He is off doing a presentation at a UFO conference in Aztec, New Mexico. So it's not going to be quite the same without our wonderful co-host, Ted. But instead, we have our associate producer, Brenda Williams, who's been kind enough to join me here uh, on a, with a very, very interesting and important show on remote viewing. And I want to ask Brenda to join us, so thanks for being here, Brenda. And oh, thank you for having me, Peg. You know, we have a lot of video tonight, yes, so we, we have to be really fast. So I'm going to go ahead and just introduce the first clip. Mm -hmm. And we have David Morehouse, which we interviewed while we were in Laughlin in February. And he was an, a, an elite military group. And while he was there, he was trained as a remote viewer in the military. So if that clip's ready, you could go ahead and roll it. Okay. 
background. Uh, don't have a lexicon. Wasn't that kind of a person. Didn't understand it at all. Grew up as, an, as the son of a second generation army officer, making me the third. And was really spent my life just being prepared to be an army officer. And so there I was. Uh, I was an infantry officer, an airborne ranger company commander in 1987. I was in the, uh, the deserts of Jordan in a haunted valley uh, called Botnel Ghoul, training Jordanian rangers to kill Israelis, which is a whole other uh, television show on screwed up foreign policy. Because the irony of it is, is that two months later, we'd be in Israel teaching you know, Israelis to kill Jordanians. But uh, that's America for you, isn't it? And so there I was, uh, uh, taking out a, an objective when uh, a stray machine gun round struck me in the head. <clears throat> and I had uh, a vision, uh, for lack of a better word, I, by, from an angel. And again, I struggled with what to call this because I didn't have a lexicon to support it. Was it an apparition, a ghost, an angel, uh, a being, an entity, an, uh, an emanation? Uh, you know, what was it? Uh, but something came to me in what appeared to me as a human form, uh, although with a ra very radiant countenance around it or an aura around it, which uh, those are, again, words that I've learned since that time and said to me that I had chosen the wrong path in life, uh, that I was now to choose a path of peace, and that I was to teach peace. Well, uh, those were pretty perplexing words for someone who at that juncture had spent 13 years of their life uh, studying the art and science of taking human life. Uh, I mean, I really know how to handle that. Uh, and when I came to and got up off the desert uh, floor, you know, I didn't jump up and say, boy, you will not believe what I just saw. And I didn't jump up and say, look, we're all going to have to do work on this issue of peace here now because we're really doing the wrong thing here. Um, I kept it to myself. I learned a long time ago to be my own counsel, uh, particularly when it had things that were issues that pertained to me. And in this case, I, I tried uh, little ways of getting around it to ask the questions of the battalion chaplain and uh, of other individuals about what they think might have happened or did they believe in the supernatural or the paranormal? Did they believe in life beyond death and those kinds of things? And I got a multitude of answers and I was really just trying to bring all of those into my life, try to sort it all out. I left the Ranger Battalion and went to another assignment. It was a highly classified assignment. Uh, it's funny how when we say classified, it's always highly classified. It was a classified assignment in Washington, D.C. for an organization codenamed Royal Cape. I've never talked about what they are because it endangers lives if I do that, and I think they had a very viable intelligence collection mission. So what I did, though, to go into this organization is you were required to go through an extensive battery of psychological evaluation and testing, oral and written, and many interviews and many tests. And a psychologist, a lieutenant colonel, detailed to this organization of less than 300 people which kind of gives you an indication of what the bizarre nature of the organization might have been. They wanted to know what your personal envelope was. And they ask you to come back and go through a, through a kind of a uh, assessment and evaluation once a quarter, like a therapy session. And it was during that therapy session, that uh, my second one at that unit, that I divulged and confided in this psychologist and said, these things are happening to me, help. I mean, I hoped he would pick up the phone and call Walter Reed Army Medical Center and take me there and do something at that point because I was out of control. My life was out of control. I had, I, I could, you know, I was waking up on the back lawn. I, I mean, I was missing blocks of time. I was waking up screaming at night. I, I mean, it was a horrifying experience for me. I mean, I had a pretty normal existence up until the gunshot wound and things were changing rapidly. In 1976, the um, military got involved in remote viewing, and um, that went on for several years. And the next clip you're going to see is David talking about how he was recruited into the military remote reviewing group. And the group he was involved with was called Sunstreak, and I think at another time it may have been referred to as Stargate. So if that other clip is ready to roll, why don't you go ahead and start it now? So I was recruited into an organization uh, called Sunstreak. Now, this organization uh, ended up being uh, one, of, one of several of uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA's top secret clans of psychic spies called remote viewers. 
And the definition of a remote viewer uh, per the Department of Defense is an individual selected and trained to transcend time and space for the purpose of viewing persons, places, or things remote in time and space and to gather intelligence information on the same. Hmm. That's a very scary thing. Young infantry officer, four months out of the field, uh, having commanded a ranger company to find out that kind of a thing uh, from this kind of an organization. Pretty tough for me to believe. When I sat and talked to the psychologist and said, what do you recommend? I mean, what, what's your take on all of this? It was essentially this. Well, look, you're describing things to us that, are, that don't exist, so that's paranoid schizophrenia. I mean, we can give you the medications, we can medically discharge you, or you can go to this unit where you can take this new ability that, that's presented itself to you, and maybe, just maybe, they can teach you how to harness it and use it, and you can continue to serve well and faithfully. That was my choice. My choice was to go to the unit, and I don't think anybody would dispute that. Uh, the training process at that time took what they estimated would be 12 to 18 months. Uh, which is interesting because now we're teaching it and it takes us three days to get to where, we're, where it took me six to eight months to be. Uh, it's a very structured, disciplined, regimented process of learning to do this. You started off just by looking at the historical documents pertaining to the Soviets and the Czechs and the Chinese and the Israelis and the Germans and the British involvement in all of this, how they were taking uh, slices of the paranormal and trying to figure out a way that they could use it to gather intelligence for their nations. Uh, you read from, you know, in a four-drawer file, say, from the front of the first drawer all the way to the back of the bottom drawer. And it, took, it took a long time to do that. Then you started stage one training, <clears throat> which was this, uh, this ability to learn to take uh, a series of encrypted coordinates. The coordinates not being Cartesian or Grid Mercator or Lat Long. Uh, these coordinates were randomly assigned numbers which became representative of the concept of the target in the matrix of the collective unconscious. And you don't want to think too hard about that. You just want to kind of accept it uh, and understand that it works. If you, uh, if you uh, try to figure it out, it's kind of like trying to figure out how electricity moves down a wire. Nobody's done that yet. And so uh, just accept it that it works, just like we accept it when we flip the light switch, the light comes on. Stage 2 deals with uh, the ability to perceive non-physical non -physical data at remote in the target site uh, that's temperature related, texture related, color, sounds, tastes, smells, uh, dimensionals, verticals, horizontals, diagonals, mass and density, even energetics. Moving from there into basic sketching techniques, learning how to capture geometric patterns and learning how to capture images that you perceive at the site. Not unlike um, the iris of a camera snapping open and closing, and opening and closing in different parts of the site and being able to capture in your mind's eye these textures and images and, and patterns and being able to regurgitate them onto the page. See, it's, uh, it's a strange process. It's a process now of keeping one foot in the conscious matrix and one foot in the unconscious matrix of the mind. And then moving into stage fours, which deals with an extension of stage twos, bifurcating stage twos uh, or dimensionals out of stage twos as a separate category now, dealing with aesthetic impact as it relates to the site, emotional impact as it relates to the site and the viewer, the tangibles and intangible concepts like governmental and religious and military and uh, you know political, those kinds of things. Uh, and then dealing with analytical overlay, which is the process of your own conscious mind's uh, imagination and learning how it matches uh, bits and pieces of data relevant to the target site in analytical overlay signal. And all of these things being in stage four now that you're learning to deal with and work with. Moving into stage fives where you take uh, some uh, intangible concept or AOL signal and stage five it, uh, producing emanations, disengaging from the signal line, as we say, producing emana emanations dealing with objects and attributes and topics and, or subjects and topics. Uh, and then moving into stage six, where you replicate the stage four matrix, now a stage six matrix, uh, and produce sketches that are very elaborate, that are overlays with analytical overlay. Uh, assembling data pieces into a very elaborate sketch called a rendering now. You can even do modeling. So 
that was the training process that I went through. And in going through that training process, I struggled for the vast majority of a year, at least the better part of a year I struggled with it, saying, you know, always able to rationalize away what I was doing and how I was doing it and the results I was getting. David is a very, very powerful speaker. He spoke at Laughlin, uh, the UFO Congress that we all attended. We were able to interview him there. Uh, he's also been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for his work. He's a terrific speaker. Uh, we've got, we're really trying to get pack in a lot of information tonight. We also interviewed um, Prudence Calabrese. For those of you who remember the Hale-Bopp controversy with um, Farsight Institute, Prudence was a part of that and has since gone on to have her own institute, which is called Transdimensional Systems. Thank you. And so we're going to go right to that clip with Prudence Calabrese. Viewing in January of 1996, I had uh, just learned about remote viewing. It was recently declassified, and I came across uh, Courtney Brown's new book, Cosmic Voyage. I read the book, and he was just starting the Farsight Institute at that time, and I contacted him, and, uh, and we swapped services. I built him a website, and he um, trained me in remote viewing, and I worked at Farsight for two years. I became the vice president there and was involved in all the activities of the Farsight Institute, including the infamous Hale-Bopp Comet experience in which we looked at uh, the Hale-Bopp Comet. Uh, we believed that there was an object uh, following it. Uh, there were some photographs taken by uh, a bunch of different amateur astronomers, and, and, uh, and then we were fed fake photographs. Um, and everything that, we've, that both Courtney Brown and I have ever said about the Hale-Bopp incident is exactly as it happened. We, it was a really question of bad judgment on many levels, bad science, bad judgment. And, uh, and soon after that whole incident wrapped up, I left Farsight to start my own business, Transdimensional Systems. Yeah, our, our purpose is to bring remote viewing into the real world in an operational, actual way so that people, it's not just theoretical, it becomes a complete experiential thing. You can use it to find out real answers to real problems. It's not just a way to look at Martians and greys and all kinds of wonderful things to look at in remote viewing, but, but things that also help real people. So we have a unit of active professional viewers all who have been viewing over two years. And, uh, and we're training new viewers all the time. We've done a lot of changes to the uh, systems of remote viewing that were in use up until the time we started. And uh, we've literally solved murders for police departments. We've found missing bodies. We've done work for the FBI. Uh, we also uh, do corporate viewing. We look um, at all different kinds of things, counter industrial espionage. We're involved in a case right now with a um, banking group who, whose ranks have been infiltrated by some overseas operatives. And, um, we're also building a unit for a Fortune 500 company. So. Uh, um, remote viewing can be a very accurate tool, and it can be a very inaccurate tool. What we have uh, come to the conclusion after just doing a lot of research and, and study ourselves in the science of perception is we've discovered that in remote viewing, literally every piece of data that you get is correct. Now, you may be making bad decisions about the information that's coming through, and your bad decisions may reflect in your work. So it's what we, what we teach isn't the same as the military system. We really teach a system where you learn that process of, of receiving the data so that you understand what that process is, so that you don't cloud it with judgment. And, um, and so our work is fairly accurate. It does take about 18 months to build a good remote viewer. Uh, you can learn all the basics in a week-long training course and, and have some amazing experiences in that week, but uh, to be consistent and operate at a 85% or better level of accuracy takes about 18 months. And uh, in all of the viewers in our elite unit, we have two, two different units, and in our elite unit, you have to operate at 87% um, accuracy and consistency to, to be part of the operational when we do a formal project, when we want to find out the answer to some kind of a question, we always put a team of viewers on the project. We never rely on one person's results. There are several viewers in our unit whose results we could rely on, but it's always nice to have corroboration. So we task it out to anywhere from four to eight different teams, and a team is one viewer and one monitor. We always teach monitored viewing because our viewing is the theta state viewing. You're a deep theta state. You need a monitor to help you. 
And when we do an operational type of a target, we do it double blind, and we task each of the teams something slightly different depending on their area of expertise because we profile all our viewers and we know what kinds of information they're more likely to, to get and which areas they excel in. And so we'll slightly vary the tasking for each of our teams so that there's no general tasking overlay and so that each of our teams is able to get the information that most deeply resonates with them, whether it's psychological type of data or whether it's a geographical location sketch or, or depending on you know, what you're looking for. Well, that was Prudence Calabrese. Uh, again, she was being interviewed uh, while we were in Laughlin, Nevada at the uh, UFO Congress that takes place there. You can see the caliber of people that attend these conferences. Now we're going to slip back in time a little bit. Uh, at a, the last conference in, in August, we had an opportunity to talk to Jim Mars. Jim uh, has written the book Alien Agenda. He was interviewing uh, people who were involved in the government's remote viewing team before Psychic Warrior came out. This was the book that David uh, Morehouse wrote. Jim's book was banned. He was not able to get it published, but later on he added the information from that book to the alien agenda. Uh, he has something to say on remote viewing. As I said, he interviewed most of the top people in the field. So we're going to go right on to that clip. And this is uh, Jim Mars. Along with UFOs and various other things, uh, one of the topics that's been downplayed and dismissed for so long is psychic ability. And I'll have to admit, I fell into that too. I, I didn't pay much attention to that. I figured that was, you know, newspaper horoscopes and the and the psychic hotline. But uh, in 1992, I stumbled across uh, the military intelligence officers that had been trained and were using a technique they called remote viewing. And uh, this was in the United States Army, and these were like captains and majors, and these were very credible people. And as I studied it, I found out that the United States government had been working with this since the early 70s, and that uh, in the mid-70s they had formed this uh, psychic spy unit, and that uh, they, this had gone through four administrations to the tune of some $30 million. Uh, you know, so that told me that somebody felt they were getting some good out of it, so I began to pay closer attention. And uh, basically, remote viewing is the ability to perceive persons, places, or things at distances by means other than the normal five senses. Um, the bottom line is it's what we used to call clairvoyance. And it's actually amazing because uh, I'm here to tell you it works. I interviewed the people that did it. I interviewed people that were on the oversight committees. I interviewed the scientists that uh, developed it out at Stanford Research Institute in California. Um, and, uh, and I've done it myself. It works. Remote viewing, uh, what they found in the laboratory was that uh, we all have this ability. And what's even more amazing is that this ability can transcend both time and space. You can go back in time and look at things. You can go forward in time and look at things. You can go out in space and look at things. This was confirmed in the 70s when uh, one of the scientists uh, or an and, uh, artist and, and a very gifted psychic named Ingo Swan and another fellow uh, took a mental voyage out to Jupiter and described various aspects of that planet, including the fact that it had a small ring around it. Uh, this was unknown at the time, and everybody just kind of chalked that up to, huh? But in 1979, when Voyager went out there, they came back and everything they said was confirmed. And it's this type of uh, experiment that proved the validity of the experiment, uh, of the experience. Uh, there's absolutely no question in my mind that there is a disinformation campaign being actively propagated uh, uh, regarding remote viewing. Uh, uh, let me be real clear here. This is not a absolute clear-cut uh, type of thing. You don't just maybe like read a book or watch a tape and then sit down in a chair and get crystal clear pictures of things. It just doesn't work that way. It's my opinion that remote viewing is still being used today within the government. They've buried it away very deeply because uh, uh, I think the problem here is, as in most spheres, they simply don't want the general mass public to, to really know what's going on. 
um, and this is a tool to, to penetrate uh, what's really happening. And that's the final point I'd like to make about remote viewing, and this is the thing that led me to uh, writing my book, Alien Agenda, was that, uh, and this is another thing that they've tried to downplay and act like is not going on, but it's absolutely amazing. Every single military trained remote viewer, every one, has had direct knowledge of uh, the unidentified flying objects. And they know they're real, they know they're here, they know they're visiting this planet, and they know that they come from off planet. Uh, the remote viewing experiences in this particular unit were, as I said, you know, they were, they, we were limiting ourselves to, uh, to operational targets and training targets. And people often ask the question, well, didn't you go look at the JFK assassination or the Martin Luther King assassination? Or uh, are there aliens amongst us? Uh, or are there other worlds and other places? Uh, why didn't you look at those kinds of things? And you know, the answer is that we did our jobs day in and day out. We did what the US government asked us to do day in and day out. And the US government never asked us to look at things that they had the answers to. They already knew the answers to those things. They didn't need remote viewers to go put our piece into the pie again, you know, see? So that should answer for you what the answers to, that should give you an indication of what the answers to who killed JFK and, you know, who killed Martin Luther King and, and are there aliens amongst us and those kinds of things. They're, they're, the answers are simple without me even saying them. In fact, the book that Jim was going to write with David was, um, I don't know how, but somehow it was prevented from being published. And then, fortunately, uh, Jim was able to come out with his book with remote viewing information, and then David was able to later publish his book, Psychic Warrior. And this next clip, uh, was I was very interested in while we were at Laughlin. I read his book before we interviewed him because I wanted to write down some questions. And one of the parts of the book that I found very interesting was on the Ark of the Covenant. And in this section, he answers the questions that I asked him about that. So if that clip's ready to roll, you can go ahead and start it. One of the uh, one of the remote viewing uh, sessions that was done that was recounted in the book dealt with the the Ark of the Covenant, and a lot of people want to know about that all the time. What is it? Why? It was a very bizarre session, and the thing that the the viewers have to understand is that there's no feedback to it. Feedback meaning there's nothing to really accurately cl close the loop on it. So. Let's just talk about the model of how we evaluate so that we can know whether or not what I'm getting ready to tell you has any validity or credibility whatsoever. Uh, in the model structure in coordinate remote viewing, re remote viewers are, are, are used on what are called calibration targets or training targets. Those are targets that have known quantifiable attributes that, uh, that relate to that, that target itself. And when a viewer does a session, there are all sorts of bits and pieces of colors and textures and the other things we talked about in stage two and stage fours and sketches that are all aspects of the target site. But there are 10 principal elements that you're going to be evaluated against. And that allows you then, or your evaluator then, to look at your results and say, you captured this aspect of it. You captured this and this and this and give you a, a, a numerical rating, a percentage rating of your 50% accurate, 40, 30, 10, uh, 80, whatever it might be. Never saw anybody get 100, never, despite many claims of former colleagues. Never saw 100% at all. Uh, and I've looked through every session in the historical files of that organization. Uh, unless it was to guess something as simple as uh, what color is the ball, you know, red or blue. Yeah, now we got it. But to look at something that was a very complex gestalt, no. Because we all look at it from a different perspective, different interpretations, different analytical overlays. So when a viewer is tracking at somewhere like 50, 60, 70 percent when they're climbing, then it's safe to pull the viewer and work the viewer on a target that has no feedback, if you understand. Because what's happening now is if you're running around 70 percent accurate or 60 percent accurate, then statistically speaking, Scientifically speaking, logically speaking, mathematically speaking, you're going to produce data that's going to be plus or minus some percentage points around that neighborhood of 60% or 70% accurate. It's at that time that they would send us against something or we would send each other against a target that had no feedback. 
like the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the way I perceived the Ark of the Covenant was to see this very powerful object. Uh, and, and again, without a great deal of theological background, I mean, one can pick up any of the scriptures and look or much of the analysis provided and see that uh, as we understand it through the interpretation of man, that the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, was designed very specifically, made of a, a very specific material, shittim wood, and then it covered in gold and met, had to meet certain dimensional and, uh, and height aspects and quality aspects. And as we perceived this, I say we now, meaning that there were other remote viewers that looked at the Ark of the Covenant as well. Uh, and I guess I, I want to talk first and just say, what was it? Well, it was, a, it was a device that was carried, it was portable, which was the reason that it was designed the way it was, to be carried through the wilderness with Moses and the people, uh, to be carried and brought to the temple each time they set the temple up, which was simply poles and, 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 and linen walls, and then to set up the temple. And in the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, is where they would bring the ark. The ark spun a hole to another dimensional opening. That's what the ark was used for. It was used to open a door into the four-dimensional world of God, to where the Creator existed. That was when the high priests entered the inner sanctum in the Holy of Holies to go receive revelation for the people. That was the purpose of it. And so it was put away so that there is no door because we are here for a reason. We are here to exercise free agency, to be able to choose right or wrong. We are here to learn about ourselves, to learn the nature of ourselves, the purpose for being here, where we will go when we leave here. We are here to gain an education. That's what we're here for. We're here to gain wisdom, knowledge, and then wisdom. That's what we're here for. If the portal were here and, and, and existed for us now, and we could spin it up and step there, then what free agency would there be? You see, that was all part of the great grand plan was that you know, the knowledge wouldn't be easy, it would be difficult. It would be a struggle to gain. When I saw the ark, I saw and stood in the presence of it, and around it was, I mean, there was so much energy emitting from it that all around it was this ball of light, but immediately layering itself around this ball of light or energy for lack of a better term, was this layer of evil, of just absolute slime. I mean, looking inside at the ark as though it were pasted to the glass of a fishbowl, looking inside at it, and this fishbowl hold this power, holding it back, in a, holding it in abeyance, holding it back so that it could not come in to touch it or be near it. Yet it was just this sense and presence of being there of just this coveting, of wanting to have that key, that doorway in their presence, and yet we're not allowed to have it. There's another significant part that I seven, several sev, seldom talk about, and that was that for the first time in my life, I understood, I think, uh, and this somewhat defies language, I understood the nature of goodness and evil because I stood in the presence of goodness and power and light that was so powerful that I understood it as evil because the power to create is the power to destroy. And all of that exists in, one, in that one realm. I mean, that the power of the creator is also a destructive power. And so I stood in, 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 in the presence of pure goodness and light and understood that it was so significant that it registered to me as evil. And that was a very perplexing, uh, approach to an understanding of the, of the nature of, of, of the creator and of creation and of destruction. Well, to give you an idea of what a compelling speaker David is, uh, we really enjoyed his talks. We had a chance to sit down and chat with him uh, just one-on-one -on -one for several hours. and. Uh, he, he was very, very compelling. As a matter of fact, I think for me that was the highlight of the conference, was uh, David's talk. Uh, not just because I'm very interested in remote viewing. I have been doing a lot of practicing remote viewing myself. Uh, it takes a lot of discipline. It's, it's not something for me that just comes really easily. 
uh, but it is fascinating seeing basically how it works. What did you think of this talk, Brenda? Well, I, as you said, I thought he was a very articulate speaker. He was very relaxed, and you could tell that he had a passion about what he was talking about. And in fact, um, you know, the reason why he even wanted to come out with a remote viewing, which ended his career, you know, he ended up with, uh, what, I forgot what, it, dishonorable, not dishonorable, but less than honorable. less than honorable discharge, was because he felt like remote viewing was, should be for the people and not for the military to use for um, their secret agendas. And I thought that was pretty incredible for someone to do what he did knowing that he was going to end his career and basically it changed his life. And as you know, he did say to us that it's a day-to-day -day basis that he has to decide whether or not, you know, I want to do this today or I, I don't want to deal with this. Yes. Yeah, I asked him, at, you know, when we were having a, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I said, David, if you had to do it all over again, would you have ducked from that bullet? And uh, he, he did say, it depends upon the day. Some days he wished that he hadn't ducked and that the bullet had found its mark and that he wouldn't have had any of these problems, which is sort of a death wish. On another day, he wishes that he had ducked and his life had gone on as planned. He was destined for stars. He came from a military family. His father was military, I believe, even his grandfather. I'm not sure of that, but he was destined for stars. And suddenly, his whole life was turned upside down. His family, his marriage, um, everything ended with this coming out with this information about this government program. This, his, well, it's all in this book. Um, the Psychic Warrior. Uh, it's a terrific read. Yes. It really is good. I mean, I, you can understand the perplexity of the situation he was in because, you know, this man lived and breathed the military all of his life, and then all of a sudden he has his angel telling him that you have to talk of peace. And it's like he said, how can someone who's trained to kill all of a sudden switch gears and talk of peace? And then when he came back, his wife was a trained nurse, and the first thing she thinks is that he needs to go to the hospital. Something's wrong with him. And But what I found very interesting about his teaching of the remote viewing, as opposed to what I've heard other remote viewers talk about, is the aspect that after you learn the basic remote viewing, he talks about you have to, everybody, when they're born, they have something that they need to work on. And before you can go into extended remote viewing, you have to go through this part where you actually connect with what it is that you're here to work on. And he said it could be as simple as forgiving somebody for something or um, loving more. Yeah. Just, it, you know, it didn't really matter what. And it could be a, a whole gamut of different things. But he said that before you could go into extended remote viewing, that you need to really touch that because if you didn't, your remote viewing sessions would be um, what they would be um, just, I don't know, it, it, it would affect what you were remote viewing mm -hmm. and what you were seeing and it would be contaminated. I think that was the word I was looking for. Well, I think sometimes people do have a, a you know, kind of a skewed impression of what, just exactly what remote viewing is. I think, in a sense, it's been somewhat sensationalized, like you, uh, you know, you suddenly are in the midst of the thing that you're remote viewing, and, and, and it's crystal clear, and, you see, and, and it, usually it isn't that way. It can be very subtle impressions that you're getting. Generally speaking, if you're seeing things crystal clear and you're getting this incredible vision, it's probably wrong, because it's probably your imagination coming in. Um, we have a, a couple of books, other books here on the table. This one is by another remote view, uh, viewer by the name of Joseph McMonagall, The Ultimate Time Machine. This is his latest book. Uh, he wrote, also wrote the book Mind Trek, which I have lent out and I don't have right now. And, um, but Mind Trek really gives you a uh, practical step-by-step uh, how-to information for remote viewing. And it's, it's really good, a basic, kind of a basic primer. And you have another one there, Yes, right um, this is a book written by Howard Bloom. I don't know what camera's getting this. And it's called Out There, Howard Bloom. And what's interesting about this book that I thought was, uh, he talks about a secret meeting that was held at the Pentagon in 1987 
to actually give a demonstration of remote viewing, and that's when Ingo Swan, who is a uh, artist and a scientist, actually demonstrated remote viewing among these military and uh, Pentagon officials. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, uh, apparently he uh, wowed them with his ability to see inside of a closed box, objects inside of a box. As a matter of fact, during one of the tests, they had put a, a box with a light in it uh, in another part of the room, and, or a place off the room, and Ingo Swan is saying, well, it's dark, I can't see what's in the box, it's too dark. And they thought it was amiss, and when they checked, the light had gone out in the box. And so it was uh, pretty eye-opening. But at this time, our country is also quite paranoid. This was back in the 70s when the Soviet Union and other countries were really experimenting with the psi factor for spying and for gathering intelligence data. And we did not want to be left out. We wanted to really stay in with what was going on in, in the, the psychic realms. And so that was why once this got started, there was a lot of money, millions of dollars, over 20 years was spent uh, both in California at SRI and also a military spot place, it wasn't really a base, but in Maryland where uh, the remote viewers were also training. And uh, it's, it's quite an interesting story, but David's premise now is to get it out. Yes, I think that's uh, very important to him, but I think it's also important to us as he ex was explaining that this is like the next consciousness for us, is to remote view and to be able to find your own answers. And you can go, you know, we look at linear time as g moving forward. There's always, um, you have to move forward in time, but when you remote view, it's open the past, the present, and the future. It's, it's all merging into one which is sort of an intriguing concept when you think about it. It's kind of difficult for us to accept that the time is all merging at one time. Yes, yeah, simultaneous time is really is a tough one. But I have found it interesting when, um, and we're, we're, the whole premise of remote viewing is you don't know what you're targeting. You don't know the subject of what the remote viewing session is. If you know what it is, if you're front-loaded, it usually is not considered valid because then your imagination can, can come in and give you all kinds of things. But what I find what is interesting is it's almost like learning another language. I, I consider it the language of the superconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And some things just do not make sense. You, know, you get these impressions and these words, and, you, and your, your liter, literal mind, your left brain, really wants to create the story. It wants to get the answer of what you're supposed to be targeting. Let, let me ask you something. You were talking yeah. about front-loading. Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, a lot of people out there aren't remote mm -hmm. viewers. And aren't you talking about a monitor, having a monitor in the room? Because I know from talking with David, and I had you know, some time while we are in Laughlin to have some private conversations with him, I know remote viewers see it differently. Some think that you need to have a monitor, where David's premise is that you don't need to have a monitor, that in fact a monitor could actually give away by body language, you know, the target. What do you, how do you feel about that, since you are remote viewing? Uh, yeah, I, sometimes we throw out these terms and we forget that people don't know what we're talking about. Front-loading means that you know what you're supposed to be remote viewing. And the whole idea of remote viewing is you don't, you have, you're supposed to be what they call blind. Mm -hmm. You just get a set of coordinates. And uh, so when I said front-loaded, I meant that people who know what the target is, then it's not valid data, really. Uh, yes, there's monitored and unmonitored sessions. Monitored being you have a, a monitor there to kind of help you along, and generally speaking, the monitor should not know what the target is either, because they can very subtly influence your answers. You, and I have found that I can all, sometimes do better with a monitor who knows what the target is, because I can sense that they are, I, I'm getting it right, just by their so, so subtle body language. Generally speaking, I don't have a monitor, I just work all by myself. It's a lot harder, you get no feedback, you just Is that what uh, the double blind is referred yes. to, having a double blind? Yes, that means you don't know what the target is, and the monitor doesn't know either. He's just helping you stay 
within the protocols, doing, it, it's very structured. It's amazingly structured. It's not um, just getting out there and, you know, doing kind of like visionary stuff. You know, it's, you have to stay in the structure. And if you go out of structure, you're told to get back into it. Uh, really one, fast. One thing that David was talking about that I thought was interesting was the ideogram. Yeah. He said that as soon as you start, the first thing you do is you just you write or draw something on the paper, and then you work from that. Is this the process that you're using and the technique that you learned? Yes. Yeah. There uh, basically the techniques vary a little bit, but uh, they're all very similar. Yes. An ideogram is just a gesture that kind of gives you a clue as to what the target's about. You can't think about it too long. You just do it because your hand will help you, um, you know, get, get a clue as to whether this is about a person, a place, or an event. And that's just, just for starters. So well, the ideogram does, that's what that function does. Well, when he talked about extended remote reviewing, to me that was like going out of body. And um, yeah. from what I read in the book, you actually going out of body and you're actually visiting there in your etheric body, the site, um, is, which is what William Bullman, which we met uh, in August, was, uh, you know, out of body expert. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, extended remote viewing is more of an out of body technique. Uh, at the Monroe Institute, they um, also, uh, uh, Joseph McMonagle has worked with the um, people at the Monroe Institute in order to learn to get out of the body before remote, and then to actually, out of body, go to the place that you're supposed to be remote viewing. This is much more difficult. It takes a lot more time. You have to be proficient in having out of body experiences. Controlled or coordinated remote viewing, which is what the first step is not, it's not so much having to be out of the body. You really get, to, you have to listen to the whisperings of your superconscious mind mm -hmm. and put it and be able to write it down, draw pictures, even sculpt with clay in sort of a semi meditative state. And um, I know we're getting closer to the last clip. We've got about a minute before we're going to run that. Brenda, maybe you could you, talk about... Uh, oh, yeah. I think you were going to make an That's announcement right. I have first. announcements to make. Yes. Now I've got to hurry up and talk. Okay. <laughs> our time here in Tucson for our live show is changed. We're going to be viewing and we're going to be showing our TV show the first, third, and fifth Fridays of the month live here in Tucson. For the rest of you folks, this probably won't affect you. Our next show, which will be the first show of in April... The first Friday in April, we're going to be talking about alternative energies, hydrogen, and uh, I think it's going to be very interesting for a lot of people out there are interested in that. And now we have something very special for our viewers before we go out tonight. It's a called Off the Record Special Report, and it's something that Ted and I were very interested in, and we actually were able to catch David before he left Sunday. Uh, and talk about this. So if that clip is ready, uh, this is uh, Off the Record Special Report. We roll? Shoot. Well, uh, about two months after TWA Flight 800 uh, went down, I was contacted by Christina Borges and a producer, two-time Emmy Award winning producer for CBS Reports. Uh, in Manhattan, New York. And she asked if I would use uh, Remote Viewing Technologies, uh, the company, uh, to employ uh, police officers to augment their investigative uh, efforts in search of uh, the answers to what brought Flight 800 down. And so we have been training in Remote Viewing Technologies about, we've been training police officers for about two years at that juncture. We had about 300 and some odd police officers trained. So we employed 60 police officers who were working pro bono uh, across the country, and we scattered them purposely because we didn't want to be anybody to be able to identify specifically where they were or get to all 60 of them. And we used their, their remote viewing skills after we calibrated them. We used them against uh, TWA Flight 800, going backwards in time to perceive an event. And that's all they knew. <clears throat> and we were trying to see what kinds of pieces of evidence they could pull out of uh, the flight, what happened to the flight, uh, where was the flight struck, uh, 
what ha you know, what what were the images, what were the perceptions of that the events that took place that night. And the remote viewers all perceived elements of a missile and a missile and ships and water and aircraft and helicopters and other things. But probably the most critical thing that they pulled from all of this was about 80% of them saw something that they described as a rod of light, or others called it a beam of light that came from the ground, not the water. And in all of the profiles that they sketched of the aircraft, all of the impact points for this beam of light or rod of light were on the left-hand side of the aircraft, which did not support the missile theory. The missile theory was that the, the missile came from the water or from out in the water, from either a submarine or from a ship or something else, and that all of the points of impact would have been on the right-hand side. And so it caused us to look very carefully at where and what and uh, might, what might have happened what, where would this rod of light come from, or this beam of light? And then we started looking at the lay of the land and identified Brookhaven National Labs and a top secret naval weapons test facility that shared a fence line with, uh, with the National Laboratory. We started uh, asking individuals that worked at the labs what was going on there, what was being tested. And gradually we came to individual sources that indicated to us that uh, the weapon that was being tested tonight uh, the Flight 800 was struck was a high-powered microwave weapon, a directed energy weapon, being built in support of a strategic defense initiative. And it was a weapon that produced 1.4 gigawatts of power, that's a billion watts of power, in a concentrated stream of electrons guided by a self-generated electromagnetic field. And that weapon has an electromagnetic pulse effect. That's what it kills with. And it's designed to kill systems. Uh, and that night, a drone Tomahawk missile was fired from the decks of the USS Normandy that was, was climbing up to altitude to be fired at by this high-powered microwave weapon when TWA Flight 800 came in in a flight corridor that was established by the FAA because this test was, was going on. This cor corridor was codenamed Betty. And TWA Flight 800 came into what is called the gun target line. They came in between Brookhaven National Labs where the weapons system, and unfortunately, Flight 800 came in low, slow, and late in Corridor Betty, came into the gun target line, and we were uncertain as to exactly what the mechanism for uh, triggering the weapon was. We, we, we had a number of sources that kind of just offset one another. One was that it was an automatic acquire and fire uh, mechanism, which said that radar sweep would have been looking for the drone Tomahawk when they were, had notification that the Tomahawk came up. It was looking for a radar indication that the, that the target was in position. When it looked and tracked uh, the drone, TWA Flight 800 came in between the drone and the radar, so it saw them as one and the same, and when it acquired the target and had it over the target area, it fired on it instantly at the speed of light. And the other was that there was a mistake that a technician misread the radar scope indications and thought that he had acquired the drone Tomahawk when in fact he had acquired 800, a uh, commercial airliner, and then pushed the button to fire the weapon, thinking he was killing the drone Tomahawk and instead hitting Flight 800. Um, after all of this was brought to bear, uh, there was a, a, a large report that was prepared uh, was presented to CBS. Uh, the CBS executives refused to do the report. Uh, the producer uh, was subsequently fired. Uh, the offices were raided by the FBI on all of the investigative data that we pulled in after about four months of work, uh, and four months of remote, remote viewing work, uh, that just continued to augment the investigative effort from this small team uh, for CBS reports. Uh, so the whole project was scrapped by CBS. The CBS is owned by GE. GE owns, has a subsidiary, which is Philips Labs, which has now been sold off to a foreign, uh, as a foreign corporation. But Philips was the weapons designer. Uh, the Philips Labs built the high-powered microwave weapon that was being built in support of the SDI initiative. And the reason the whole thing was covered up was because uh, on May uh, 17, 1993, Les Aspen, the Secretary of Defense for the Clinton administration, the brand new Clinton administration, uh, declared to the American people that we were at the, quote, end of the Star Wars era, end quote, meaning that we were now no longer going to continue to build weapons 
that would be put on platforms and placed in orbit around, uh, around our planet to kill satellites or to kill uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles at the, boat, at the boost phase or post-boost phase. So that, that was pretty alleviating to a lot of people. Nobody wanted that to happen. And whether you're an advocate of or a proponent of uh, the SDI initiative or not is immaterial. What's, uh, what has to be understood at this point is that Les Aspen said we weren't doing it anymore. And the presidential, uh, President uh, Clinton, his administration said we're not doing this anymore. But in fact, they continued to spend billions of dollars uh, to develop these weapon systems. And the weapon brought down a commercial airliner four months before the re-election bid by President Clinton. So the cover-up, the lie had to be brought into, brought into place because he could have, if we had shot it down with a missile, it would have been a legitimate accident, an honest mistake, and we would have admitted it to the people and paid off the surviving family members, and, and life would have gone on. But we had, to, we had to create a lie and a deception because we were trying to get a president reelected whose administration had told the American people they weren't building this weapon anymore. Well, we know it's a microwave. We knew that it was a microwave weapon for a number of reasons. One, we had uh, statements uh, which, of course, were non-attributable, and they were from individuals that uh, wanted to remain anonymous to protect their, uh, protect their jobs, protect perhaps their lives, uh, certainly to protect uh, their livelihoods and everything else that they held sacred in life, because to admit, it, admit something like this would have been the end of everything that they knew and held sacred. Uh, but they indicated and told us uh, in no uncertain terms that the weapon system was being tested. Uh, and we also went uh, to various sources on the internet before this all exploded uh, and looked at the Phillips Labs projection schedule for, and test projection schedule, which included uh, ground-based testing during the time that TWA Flight 800 was, was brought down. Their projections for space testing uh, went into 1998, 99, uh, the year 2000, 2006, between 2000 and 2006, their projection schedule said that they would now have a weapons platform in space. We also knew, uh, based on Suffolk County Medical Examiner reports uh, that came back, uh, and, and which we got our hands on, and other Suffolk County Medical Examiner personnel uh, gave us statements that said that individuals uh, were brought from the water, uh, flight attendants were brought from the water that were located in the galley where this high-powered microwave would have struck uh, center of mass because it acquired it with a radar-based uh, uh, target acquisition system, uh, that they had pieces of the galley, metal from the galley, fused to their backs, fused to their backs. That doesn't happen in an explosion. The, the heat is not intense enough uh, to fuse metal to tissue in that respect. That only happens when you have 1.4 billion watts of power striking something like that. Uh, we had other indications from medical examiner personnel that uh, cranial cavities were being opened and that brains were being taken out and eyes were being taken out because uh, eyes and brains and uh, spinal fluid and blood all gel instantly when hit by a high-powered microwave. And since this was, of course, an accident, but now we had human bodies that have been microwaved uh, the Defense Department and the Department of Energy were not going to pass up the opportunity to, uh, to do autopsies and or to look at, the, at the, neural, uh, the neural destruction that takes place in the human body when hit by a microwave. So what they were doing is, is, is removing the brains and the eyes and other things that they wanted to take, organs that they wanted to examine, putting the bodies in, powdering with formaldehyde, and then sealing the castets, caskets and marking them uh, that they were you know, impartial remains and that the casket was not to be opened. And so they were shipped home to, to surviving relatives, and the caskets were never opened. And there was a process of exhumation being done in France for us uh, before this report was canceled by CBS, where we were actually going to exhume bodies and try to take a look at it and find out whether or not, indeed, some of these cavities, the brains have been removed and the eyes have been removed as well. 